1903, the Wright brothers invented the airplane. It was hard to imagine then that today there would be over 500,000 people traveling in the air at any point in time. In 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto invented Bitcoin and the blockchain. For the first time in history, his invention made it possible to send money around the globe without banks, governments or any other intermediaries. Satoshi is a mystery character and just like the Wright brothers, he solved an unsolvable problem. Whenever this happens, it inspires incredible innovation. The concept of the blockchain isn't very intuitive, but still many people believe it's a game changer. Despite its mysterious beginnings, the blockchain may be the airplane of our time. I found out about blockchain first, as, as most people around that time were, through, through Bitcoin. Uh, and personally, uh, at first, I thought that Bitcoin was an absolutely terrible idea. I was teaching at Stanford back in 2010, and a teaching assistant for the class sent me an article. Um, she said, oh, there's this really cool thing. It, it's open source money. And I, I remember thinking, open source money, isn't that cool? But it'll probably never work. I did what most people uh, uh, do the, the, fir the first moment they are exposed to Bitcoin. I discounted it. I thought this was silly internet money. You could mine it. It's like a a golden goose, uh, and uh, uh, it took me about a year uh, to really uh, re-explore the technology. And so by 2012, um, I did what I tell most people to do today, is turn off your phone, lock your door, and study this technology for a day. It's the best advice I could give. I was on a sabbatical from work. I decided I'd take a year off, live off some savings, figure out what I want to do. It was, it was there that I discovered this little orange icon with a, a B in the middle. I said, what is this strange thing? So I started looking, okay, Bitcoin, interesting. Um, that was about 2012, 2013, and I haven't left the space since. I've just continued further and further down the blockchain uh, rabbit hole, if you will, and I've been pleasantly surprised and had no reason to crawl my way back out and find another technology. There's a point at which it's almost like you can't stop. It just gets so interesting and you're so fascinated by it and you just want to learn more and more and more. And even, by the way, to this day, it's, it's almost, there's, there are new developments, you know, there are new ways of solving problems, new approaches, and it's, it's very exciting to be in this world. It feels really exciting to be involved in blockchain. It feels like we're at the forefront of something that has at least the potential to transform our interactions between each other. Uh, between corporations, the underlying infrastructure of both the, the private sector, but also of government. For me, part of the fascination is that we don't yet know exactly what this thing is, and yet there were still lots of people gathering around it. And I thought of it as like, you know, a space rock that crashed on Earth, right? You'd have a bunch of people that gather around, and they're all pointing, what is this thing? And you, you don't really know what it is, but it's still very interesting. So for me personally, the blockchain has two main ingredients, two main technical ingredients. So one ingredient is cryptography. And when I say cryptography, I really mean asymmetric cryptography. And the other ingredient is so-called distributed systems. But these are the two main things. If you understand these two things, then basically understand all the technical details of blockchain or Bitcoin for that matter. You have the ability to create records that are indelible. You have the ability to transfer value by making updates to those records. And you have the ability to automate 
updates to the records through these things called smart contracts. And that means, potentially, that you could transform the structure of financial services. Today, there are all sorts of institutions that exist to maintain sets of records, to be a trusted third party, as the industry parlance for it. And that role is potentially fundamentally reshaped. Blockchains are networks. And networks um, that we see today, uh, Alibaba, uh, Airbnb, uh, Uber, uh, those are interesting networks, but they're centralized networks. Here, you're going to have networks that are decentralized, that are uh, working more on a, a, as a cooperative. Um, I think the, 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 some of the challenges will be what are the economics of those networks, what are the economics of certain blockchains versus today's discussion, which is all about the technology. I think tomorrow's discussion will be about uh, how do you build network effects off of these new railroads. And what's especially interesting for me is that it was a grassroots movement from the technology sector, not, not sort of the uh, movement of, uh, of established businesses trying to uh, trying to get in uh, to, to find a new selling point. It's, it's, it's really a bottom-up movement from, from us geeks. It's one of the most amazing things in science that happened in the last hundred years, that this thing is actually possible, that you can digitally sign transactions or other kinds of information so that you can prove to people that you actually signed this. Uh, it's much more secure than these, you know, curvy, wriggly signatures we usually use in our everyday life. And it probably will replace those things soon enough. We spent two years uh, trying to understand this space and and what it what it really meant, you know, and we found out that it meant a lot more than just another digital currency. It, it actually, uh, as the blockchain became more influential in our thinking, we began to realize that it was a profound shift in how the internet could be used to create new forms of value and how it could be used to enfranchise, you know, and include people in global finance. We've had the internet for years now, and on the internet, still nobody knows whether you're a dog or not. Um, you know, identity fraud is completely out of control, data breach. So, you know, the area where we need some new thinking um, is in the sort of ident in the identity space. And so maybe the technology brings something new into that space, and we need it fairly quickly because we haven't fixed the identity problem for people, but we're about to put 10 billion, trillion, gazillion things on the internet. We can have a, a trust relationship without really having ever met each other or having done business at all with each other. I think that's fundamental, one of the fundamental things. Security is another. Um, blockchains are military-grade cryptology, and they've never been cracked. It isn't, when you hear about hack, hackers, you know, stealing Bitcoin or whatever, they're not stealing from the blockchain itself. They are stealing at the point of entry, at the wallet level or at the browser level, and they intercept those messages. But the blockchain itself is, is very secure. The Internet of Things will probably be the best test case for a lot of blockchain technology. Because if we're going to have millions of, or billions or trillions of Internet-enabled devices doing everything from driving us around to managing our affairs to um, monitoring our health, they're going to need a way to move and store and manage value and data that has value in a way that's secure and private. And right now we don't have that. And I, I'm concerned about the ubiquity of data and, and how it flows in and through internet connected devices. I think with a value platform like blockchain, we can at least address some of these problems and maybe even create new opportunities. We 
cannot sit in our office and, and study and whatever. Of course, we do that as well. But we need to go out. We need to particip participate uh, in this whole um, blockchain community. And uh, honestly, what is very new to me, especially the younger person in my team, how enthusiastic they are about that. So if there is a hackathon, for example, organized, whatever, they never come to me and say, hey, can I go there? Do you, uh, can I get some money uh, for that? They just go. You know, they're so interested. Uh, they, they just go and participate and, and share what, what they learned. And we have further discussion. And I believe this is really a new way also for us how we deal uh, with this kind of new technology. We are really in the middle of it. Nobody tells us what to do. It's really we together shaping, let's say, what what the ambition, what, what we stand for in the end for blockchain. We need to be much more technological. We need to have an awareness of how something is programmed in order us to check if the programming is, wrong, is correctly or not. So these might be a kind of capabilities that at the moment we have, but not in the way that it's needed for the future. So I think in the future, you always need to have a kind of IT or technological link to the things in order to understand them. Otherwise, you always need your IT guy ne sitting next to you, helping you in the understanding of, of the problem. This is not something that's going to impact one or two industries. It's going to affect every industry in the same way that uh, you know, the internal combustion engine affected almost every industry, the same way the internet affected almost every industry, the way the steam engine created new industries. So this is one of those big generational technology shifts that will require a concerted and focused response. Otherwise, you'll miss the boat. And I think we are all also in the financial service industry trying to recognize that we don't have to be defensive of that, but we rather have, have to embrace not just this technology, but this enabler that it brings us to actually access a vastly underutilized or un undiscovered market um, that we have to really do business with on an eye-to-eye -eye level. We talk to um, all sorts of senior executives in financial services, and often we talk to them and they'd say, well, you know, we, we, we've, you know, we've looked at Bitcoin, we've had smart people come in and explain to us how the blockchain works, but I still just really don't understand what it means for my business. And I think that makes sense in a way, because if you think about an iPhone, for example, what's really important when a new iPhone comes out? Is it that there's some new chipset or they have you know, some new way of uh, you know, compressing frequencies? I'm, I'm not an engineer. I don't know how any of that works. What matters to people is what they can do with the technology. Of course, success is in, in no way guaranteed. Uh, one day we may look back on this and say, oh, wasn't that great? You know, but if you ask me, I think there's undoubtedly a huge amount of progress that has already been made, and there's something here. I find it hard to believe that I'm going to look back in 10 or 20 years and say, oh, none of this ended up happening because we're really seeing a new way of transacting value on the Internet. I know how big financial institutions work. First of all, they're not going to run out and do something reckless with technology. This is people's money and livelihood that they're working with, right? So this is, these are slow upgrade processes. These systems, once they get implemented, will run in parallel with the old systems for a while before you have a switch over to the new one. That's standard in technology upgrade. So I knew this was going to take time. Uh, but yes, yeah, sure, there are antagonists. Uh, the, there are players who are threatened by their business model. It's the AT&T, Verizon, Kodak analogy again. Their business model is threatened by this. And of course, they're going to do things to, to try to slow down and water down the transformational networks uh, that, are, that are being developed. And so there's a game theory approach to, to how the uh, technology is being rolled out 
in the markets for sure. We made different roundtables here in Zug uh, after the, the start of this Bitcoin experiment. And uh, for example, we invited uh, banks which are living here in Zug, people from Zug, bankers from Zug, and uh, we, we tried to connect them with people of the Zug Crypto Valley. And uh, yeah, okay, they, they have been talking together, but uh, they, these bankers uh, were not so very happy. Okay, they said uh, there are different things with law and, uh, and it's not so easy for us. But, uh, but uh, it's also a question of attitude. I think it's the same thing as for our city, for our administration, the banks have to get ready. And I know that in a way uh, they are defensive, but on the other hand, they have uh, in research, they have made teams uh, which face these questions. And uh, maybe they are waiting a little bit now, but uh, they can't deny it, I'm sure. I think there's going to be a lot of disruption, a lot of revolution with respect to blockchain-based technologies. And um, what, what that's going to drive is, is not necessarily uh, uh, banks uh, worrying about other banks being competitors. Uh, what, what banks worry about is the, uh, is the bank of one, you know, the, the next generation of, of, of a banking network that's uh, resident on, on a phone that's decentralized, that's distributed and uh, is, is based on a, on a digital token, a digital asset that's not actually issued by a bank or a government or, or anybody else. So it creates all these different uh, permutations and opportunities, uh, not only for enterprises and governments, but also for, uh, for society. We see a lot of examples of banks and consulting companies and other um, you know, big four audit firms talking about how they can strip cost out of the business of, I don't know, trading in public markets or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but if you take the example of public markets, how can you cut cost out of a market that doesn't exist in the future? What if the trading of securities happens peer-to-peer -peer in the marketplace that doesn't have the traditional intermediaries of exchanges and brokers and agents and escrow agents and clearing houses and all these other parties that we rely on? That's the cost you're cutting out, but what if the market can function without them? So the important thing for big leaders of big companies, is not just to think about cost, but also to think strategically. What can this technology enable me to do that I wasn't able to do in the past? I think it's going to take a long time for it to weave its way into the system. Uh, it may take a normal tech upgrade cycle for, for it to fully uh, weave its way into the system. But I've said publicly, I think within 20 years, that financial services will be just software. And the smart contracts technology in particular is going to automate a lot of the things that institutions and people handle today. Seventy-four percent of the world's population, according to the World Bank, does not have access to basic financial services. In my home country, in the United States of America, which is one of the most wealthiest countries in the world, um, about 50 percent of the population does not have access to basic financial services, including bank accounts. There is a huge amount of people around the world that don't get to experience and be a part of the global economy. Um, because they don't have access to the financial system for a variety of reasons. I do think this technology will lift uh, a lot of people out of poverty, but will also be an inclusive technology that allows more people to engage in global commerce. You know, I don't like to think that we're creating so much prosperity for the less than 1%. I like to think of purpose-led businesses. And by the way, that's the trick, I think, for large corporations is to understand that the cost efficiencies of embracing this new technology will potentially widen their accessible markets at a cost that's reasonable. And that in itself will create prosperity in different areas. Something that I think we should think about. Pretty soon, when smartphones can be had for less than $5 each, which is right around the corner, 
nearly every person living in poverty on Earth will have access to a smartphone and be connected to a network. That is game-changing in and of itself. When you have digital wallets on these phones and you have the ability to trade assets, we're going to find, we're going to answer that question, what happens when everybody has money? Because capitalism itself has thrived in some areas by the natural exclusion of others from markets. It actually uses that scarcity principle as its driving basis. So what happens when money is not scarce? We will look at people and say, okay, what is, what is the things that, you can, that I cannot do and that we can you know, join forces? Um, much more than today where we look at people and say, okay, how big is your car and how much money do you have on your bank account? So I, I believe that the, the future will be even more human or humane, uh, uh, no, human, uh, than, uh, uh, than the last hundred years that we've seen. So I don't think blockchain is a revolution. I think it has been done forever, like for 40 years, which is really forever in computer science in my domain. Uh, so both uh, parts, both ingredients, the security and the distributed systems have been around since the 70s, basically, since the early 70s. And this is not the revolution. But the revolution, in some sense, or the evolution is that... Uh, that jobs will change. Uh, that's something I believe in, that jobs will be, you know, digitized in some sense. Computers will do a lot of the manual labor that we still see in this kind of service domains today. It's called yeah, the fourth technological revolution. And I think uh, we, are, we are at the beginning of such a revolution just now. And that's why we, we don't close the eyes. We <laughs> and... Some people, some people say, okay, there will be much trouble, people will lose their work and, 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 and everything, jobless people. And that's, I'm sure it will happen, but it's better we face it than uh, we deny it. Offshore working or automation or robots, are they threatening our work? And it's a real life question when your own son who's prepared to go to get an advanced education asking you that question. And I concluded that, yes, I do have a genuine answer, that it's not threatening. It is forcing us to think a little bit different, but if we do it smarter, we actually give also the next generation a great new opportunity to actually reinvent why they get up every morning and why they go to work and make sure they really make best, best use of uh, the degree they studied for and the things they really want to do in life. I want to make the world better, just better. Okay, and what's, whatever my measure of better is or yours is what might be valued by society. But the other thing is this wonderful opportunity to create a little bit of prosperity because what prosperity offers you is independence. We don't have to have people who are living in squalor and, and simply you know, fighting for a handful of rice every day. We, we, there, there's too much. There's too much in the world uh, to live like that anymore. And I think that certain countries, I think even certain corporations are beginning to understand that. And certainly this movement, this blockchain movement, is the technology underpinning. The, the technology part of that mindset which exists offline as well. The idea is out. And if it's not being realized here, it may be realized there or even in the internet, uncontrollable. So Bitcoin is here. Bitcoin is here to stay and it will become bigger and bigger as the blockchain, of course, as cryptocurrencies, as the possibilities which are connected to the blockchain and cryptocurrencies that's out of the box and the whole system does not need 
any garment. It exists, it works. It's like a computer network surrounding the world. And you can say, okay, we don't want to be part of it. So be it. It's here and it won't go away. I feel like this is a generational opportunity for entrepreneurs and investors. And I quite frankly have not seen something as exciting in my entire investment career. Let's try to build a new system that is that has better trade-offs, that has better features, that has less downsides. Um, and, and let's make it work. Now the pendulum is going to swing back. And, and what that's going to do is frankly make uh, confidence in capital markets higher. Blockchain has enormous potential implications outside of financial services. And we might even actually see the, the full scale implementation of some of those more real world applications leapfrog financial services. This invention, uh, when it came up in, in the 70s, this is really one of the totally groundbreaking ideas, right? It will change society for sure in many domains. It already has changed society in the, in the sense that the internet is in some sense a secure place that you can you know, make transactions on the internet. The potential for creating trust or even permissionless trust within the internet, that's something that we haven't had before. And so its impact on society on business, on government, could be profound. Blockchain is, to be fair, nearly 10 years old. But I think it's got another 10 years to run before we really see what its long-term um, impact is. I think it's going to be a long, much more steady journey that we go down. And, and you're going to see multiple technologies inspired by this thing. Blockchain technology is not the solution to all the problems under the sun. And I think as it matures, we will begin to see its uh, potential benefits, but also its limitations. You can deny it or you can face it. And, and we always said we have to face it because uh, these things are coming up if we want or not. I've really seen very uh, long-standing partners when they saw the whole opportunity really to change, to say, hey, I don't understand everything, but I understand there is something behind. So we need really to go forward. That, that's really great. People often say that necessity is the mother of invention, but I like to say that necessity is also the mother of adoption. Because if there's a real use case that people you know, need a technology for, well, they'll start using it. I started with Commodore, we had Atari, we had Apple. At some point in time, Windows came and everybody just started to use Windows without asking what, what is the code behind it? What is the code behind moving the mouse? We have a whole lot of possibilities. Everything will change. It's like, in, in my opinion, the possibilities are endless. And it reminds me a little bit of the situation as if we all of a sudden have two huge inventions or three inventions uh, in one moment. We actually are living a very interesting window of opportunity and I'm surely very very excited to, to fully embrace that and even one little step can be a great step for mankind. And I think that we are exiting the industrial age and that we are entering an age that we still have to name. Where that will take us I think is very hard to tell at this point but my, my suspicion is it means a sort of resurgence of the notion of of community. It absolutely feels like uh, a whole new paradigm for changing the world. Yeah, we're at a crossroads. We're at a crossroads here. We, we have the wherewithal now to create technology that would actually help the entire human race. The question is, will we do it? But we can do it now. There's so much uh, innovation that blockchain technology has spurred um, all throughout all throughout the world. Um, and. Uh, I have you know, absolutely no doubt in my mind that this technology is, uh, is going to affect everybody. Um, I, would, you know, I would say uh, in, in 10, 20 years time frame, um, there won't be you know, a human being whose life is not impacted um, by this technology.